you know, it, it's really pretty simple if you want to go racing or start a car company. You basically take a real serious accounting of all your capital, and you figure your age, your life expectancy, and you figure that you just need to have enough to eat by the time you die, <laughs> and then you figure how much you can spend, because you're going to lose it all. Um, the next thing is that the regulations, as you might imagine, to make a car and to make it road legal and something you can sell to other human beings um, is a bit daunting. If you put the stack of paper of regulations on the floor, it's about seven feet tall. Well, who's the first person you call when you go to start a car company? Is it a lawyer then? Is there a consultant? There are two answers to that. If you want to go racing, um, you're still allowed to build race cars, and then you have to meet the regulations of the racing. Uh, but you can't sell those cars to be used on the road. So the first thing you do is you, find, you, you define what you want to do. What I wanted to do was make a sports car and race sports cars. And the problem is, is that unless you make and sell 300 road examples, there are very few places that will let you race. Now, the Nuremberg Ring kept letting us race because we had a huge fan base. I mean, they admit that we bring about 35,000 people to the Nuremberg Ring. So that's a fair amount of cash they make off it, so they let us do it. What I did was I wanted to make a very efficient race car, but still make it kind of pretty. And heretofore, GT cars, and you have an example of this. If, if you look at this Ford GT, this is um, what heretofore had passed as road and race cars, but the problem that Ford has that I don't have is they have to build a car that two 250-pound people can sit in. I don't do that. I make it for like someone like me and a babe. Um, <laughs> That makes it a much wider windshield for a Ford versus an SCG. My wife's a babe, by the way. Um, uh, so we have a much narrower windshield. The other thing is that LMP1, you may or may not know what those are, but what an LMP1 car does is it's very aerodynamically efficient. The difference between sports cars and race cars is aerodynamics. Now, before... LMP1s. Cars look like that. And the idea was you flowed the air over the car to the rear wing. The problem is that you can see it's a longer line from the nose of the car over the roof to the wing than it is if you can go through the car. So um, Stephen, if he's here, will close the door on the SCG. And you will see from the front that the air travels around the cockpit to the wing, which is a shorter distance. And the other thing is the shape narrows the air. So it, it goes in wide and it comes out narrow. And you know, like if you blow with an open mouth, there's very little pressure. And if you close your lips and blow, it's higher pressure. The higher pressure, the faster the air does, it flows to the wing. Now, what does an aerodynamic car do differently than the cars that you drive? If you drove the Ford GT at like Monticello, you would go to a braking point, you'd step on the brakes, you'd slow down, you'd go around the turn. This car at 130 miles an hour makes the weight of, its, of the car in downforce. It makes over 2,000 pounds of downforce. It could drive upside down. The difference is, is that the braking zone in that car might be 75 meters. The braking zone in this car, you'd go to 25 meters. It's, it's a really mind-boggling thing. And the way you drive is totally different. Like the first time I got in an SCG, Miko Salo, the Formula One driver, was one of our drivers. And he knew in advance that if they were going to let me out in the car, they had to let me out in the car because I owned it, but they were kind of nervous about it. Um, but they cleared the whole track 
for everybody else's safety, which was a good idea. And I went out and I stopped at about the 50 yard marker completely stopped because I started braking at 75 and the car stopped at 50. He said, Jim, let me explain. You come down the start finish line, okay. You go flat out, all right. You come to turn one, you go flat out through turn one. You don't touch the brakes, you just steer, you go flat out through the turn. I go, what do you mean you go flat out? He says, you go flat out, you don't touch the brake. You Take the steering wheel, you turn a little. Okay, then you come down to a turn you got a brake for, all right? He said, you're braking at 75? Yeah, he said, go down to 25, step on the brake pedal as hard as you can for two seconds, one, two. Downshift while you're stepping on the brake for two seconds, six, from six to first, let go of the brake, turn the steering wheel and floor the car out. But to make a long story short, how do you do it? You get a really talented bunch of people. And you get people whose dream has been to make race cars. Forget about the road cars, That's a, that comes in chapter two. But, and the, you know, people who are willing to ruin their lives, travel all over, never sleep, um, they get fed pretty well get paid nothing, stand in the rain, stand in the, get sunburned, rain burned, you know, get deafened if they forget to put in their earplugs. You should always wear earplugs, really, or you'll be deaf. Um, and um, you just get a very dedicated group of people, and you gotta get young people. This is like a little unnerving. And the reason you have to get young people is they have to be geeks who can, have other friends who are geeks who are working in giant companies that have supercomputers. So at four in the morning, you call up all your geek friends all over the world, and you surreptitiously gang together seven crays, giant computers, and then you crunch incredible amounts of data. It's called CFD, which is computer fluid dynamics. It's just a fancy word for like a virtual wind tunnel and you learn and data and you build cars and um, that's how you make race cars. Well, this is going to be a great movie someday. I became a road legal guy because of a very bizarre political event. When Obama was president, to get the country economically going again, he passed an act called the FAST Act which was to rebuild the infrastructure of America. This was in 2015. Buried in the FAST Act was a little proviso that small people could start car companies. I don't think anybody ever thought anybody was gonna do it, and the regulations were like pages and pages, and they were virtually indecipherable, but I read them, and then, as you probably know, there was a regime change in the country, and the guy who became president fired the head of the EPA, the head of NHTSA, which is the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, and a lot of government regulators. So I figured, bitchin', this is a great moment for me to enter an application to be a small <laughs> car manufacturer, because there's no one there. So I called the head, I called National Highway Transportation Department and a woman answered the phone and I said, hey, I want to send something to the Secretary of NHTSA. And she said, well, there is no Secretary of NHTSA. I said, oh, I'm surprised. Um, <laughs> but if I mail you something, like you'll put it on their desk, right? And she said, oh yes, we would have to put it on their desk. I couldn't open it because it's addressed to the secretary of NHTSA. I said, fantastic. <laughs> because the law that I'd also read, which was very arcane, said that NHTSA had the obligation to do one of three things. They could read your whole thing and say, wow, you've really met every requirement, which is virtually impossible, and you're approved. They could say, what, are you kidding me? 
and they say no, or they could do nothing. But if they did nothing, bizarrely under the law, this is a very little known thing about federal law, if 90 days go by and they don't do anything, it's kind of like when you're at a wedding and the guy says, speak now or forever be silent. <laughs> like you gotta speak now or those people are getting married, you know? So Nitza did not do anything for 90 days and I immediately took out a press release with 5,000 news agencies saying I had been approved as a low volume manufacturer. And NHTSA kind of freaked out and shut the loophole, but they couldn't shut it from me. So that's how I became legally able to, to build cars. Now, what does that mean under the FAST Act? It means that um, I don't have to interfere with Darwin. And by that I mean, I don't have to have airbags in the car. They have to be safe for crashes, but I don't have to have crash testing. And I have to have seat belts, but I don't have to have airbags. And I have to have a warning label that you sign if you buy one of my cars. So I wrote this warning label say, this car does not have airbags. If you do not wear your seat belts, you are gonna get killed. If you get killed by an act of Congress, you can't sue me. And, you know, if you don't tell the passenger sitting next to you to put on their seat belts and they get killed, their estate can sue you, but they can't sue me. <laughs> so I have this, you know, long thing and I wrote it out and my wife looked at it and said, Jim, no one will ever buy one of your cars. I mean, no one will sign that. No one's going to buy one of your cars. And I said, honey, you don't understand. <laughs> not only, first of all, they're not going to read it. But secondly, not only will they, they're gonna make t-shirts out of it. Like, this car can kill you. And uh, so that's what we are. We are a low volume manufacturer. We're allowed to make 325 cars a year. I don't know where they came up with that number. We are exempt from most federal motor vehicle safety standards. We're not exempt from air pollution. And we don't make polluting cars, but how do we do that? We buy admissions compliant engines that are used in other cars and we put them in our car. So the, so the road legal version of this has an engine that we buy from BMW. They use it in their M8. It's a uh, road legal admissions compliant engine of their GT3 race engine. It's a 4.4 liter twin turbo hot V where the turbos are in the center of the V, so there's very little turbo lag. And it makes about um, 850 newton meters of torque and about 700 horsepower. I mean, if you want, I can tell you about high horsepower. The, the truth of the matter is, is that you cannot put more than 650 horsepower through any road legal tire in the world. So if you have a car with 1,000 horsepower, you can brag about it at, bar, at the bar and maybe some idiot will go home with you because you, I have 1,500 horsepower. I don't know, I wouldn't. But um, the, the truth of it is that you're not gonna be faster. This car with restricted horsepower, because when we race, we have to race with restricted horsepower, with 480 horsepower and 165 kilograms of ballast, because it's so fast, they try to slow us up so that we don't like walk away from Ferraris and Porsches. Did a 633 at the Nuremberg ring. 633, think about that. I mean, if we had unrestricted horsepower, it would probably kiss Bell off 612. We crash tested one of our cars um, inadvertently, one of our customers did at the Nuremberg ring. They augured in at 200 kilometers an hour straight into the wall. You can watch it on YouTube. Um, it's pretty cool. They hit the wall, they flipped, they hit the, every side of the car. It was a 12G impact. The guy walked out, we rebuilt the car, he was racing in a month, and lo and behold, he bought another one. I don't know why. Um, so that's the gig. The, the thing about the looks in it is this was designed by Obama for replica manufacturers. So people who would make a Cobra replica or a Ford GT replica, but the way they wrote the law was that the car is intended to visually represent a car manufactured 25 years ago. 
but what the hell does that mean? I mean, I intend that this car looks like a Fiat Turbina. You can look up a Fiat Turbina and that's what I put in. You're not allowed to lie, but you, you can do it. And our second model resembles a Corvette Indy uh, concept car. And our off-road thing is from a car I, I bought that Steve McQueen won the Baja in. And it resembles that. So that's, that's how we're building cars. That sounds like the best possible scenario for almost any bureaucracy is to find that that perfect loophole unfortunately is it is it completely closed now or i mean is it is there something you can you, you know what's interesting if you tried it now nitsa would say that because they're making autonomous cars safe and figuring those out they don't have the time i don't know what would happen if you sued them but most people are too afraid to do that. I would sue them, but you know, most people wouldn't. <laughs> most people wouldn't. So, so far, no one else has become an approved low volume manufacturer except for SCG, so it's kind of strange. Um, unfortunately, this thing is an incredibly complex and expensive car to make. It takes us nine months to make. Um, and even though we sell it for $2.3 million and we have sold a number of them, we really don't make money on it. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. It's because of the development costs that we have to have gotten the company where it is now worth $30 million the wrong way. Uh, so you have to sell a lot of these to recoup that. So what we're doing is we're making a much less expensive but very cool car. It's our Model 004. If you Google SEG 004, you'll see it. It's a three-seater. It's like the McLaren F1, so it's a center seater for the driver. Uh, two passengers, because these days, I mean, every girl has two boyfriends and every guy has two girlfriends, so that works out. You can stuff them both in the car. Or you have kids, I guess. You can put the kids in the car. Um, a center driver is a wonderful car, both for the racetrack. You see a lot. It's very, it's very good to see. And um, it's very comfortable because... Uh, the more you can see, the easier it is to drive fast. That car is a retail price of uh, 460000 for the base model. It's a very curvy car. It frankly looks like a um, Ferrari P4 or a Dino Competizione, which is another car we own. And you can get it with a very rare thing, a stick shift if you want. We have a worldwide engine deal now with General Motors, so the base motor in that is a 650 horsepower supercharged motor. If that's not enough for you, you can get the CS version, which has 840 horsepower, supercharged motor and paddle shifts, um, which should be enough for you. And um, so... What, what's the weight? The, our cars are very light. Because we don't have to have things like airbags, our cars are honestly 2,500 pounds which is a, you know, a huge difference. It makes the car really fun to drive. We make a zombie hunting post-apocalyptic thing based on the Steve McQueen Baja booth. It's really gonna race the Baja, and you can then get a road legal version. You can drive over your friend's lawns in the Hamptons and terrorize them. <laughs> if you crash into their Bentleys, you won't know. They might, they will. Uh, so we're, we're doing that. And then our dream is to go and win Le Mans. So under the new Le Mans hypercar rules, which we had a lot to do with causing to go into effect, we're gonna build a very limited edition of about 20 road legal Le Mans race cars and a few, and a few of them are gonna take Le Mans and race. And you know, th so that's actually we should, we, we should talk a little bit about that hypercar uh, category now because I don't know if, if you guys remember the GT1 category years ago where it was cars that were sort of loosely based on sports cars that were you know it, it was a Porsche 911 but it was you know 10 feet longer and had uh, uh, you, you know it was, it was made out of carbon fiber How, that's coming back that's a sort of that's the, what the hypercar category is now in Le Mans coming up in uh, 2021, right? In the 60s, cars that raced at Le Mans 
could be like an MG, a Triumph, a Corvette, a Cobra, a Porsche, a Ferrari, an Aston Martin. They look like cars that normal people could aspire to own. Then, in the later years, they became very hyper-technical race cars, and they sort of lost the look of sports cars. So under the hypercar rules, you're going back to things that will look much more like an SCG and much less like an LMP1 and can actually be road legal. So that's what the formula is changing to. So far, only two companies have committed for the 2020-2021, us and Toyota, but the next year, Ferrari, McLaren, and Aston will also be there. Um, there are actually a lot of really good roads. Um, there are great roads around Bear Mountain that you probably know about. There are roads um, up near Ellenville that are really good roads. Uh, if you get up early, there are a lot of great roads. I mean, uh, driving up Route 22 uh, very early in the morning is good. Um, Cyclists are always the, the issue. I mean, you have to be careful of watch, watch out for cyclists. So the roads could be great, but on, on a Saturday or Sunday, you get a lot of cyclists in the summer. Yeah, but if you don't have any particular workday rules, you can get up on Tuesday morning at four <laughs> in the morning and go out. <laughs> when I was a kid and first got my license, 684 was built, but for some governmental reason, it didn't open for about four years. It was a fantastic place to race. We used to go open the barricades and go from White Plains from the beginning of 684 all the way up to Route 22. The highest speed I hit was in my 275 GTB, 172 miles an hour. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that now. Um, but there, there are good roads. and. Um, but the, the thing is, you got to be careful. You can't drive on the road the way you used to be able to drive when I was young and stupid. But a club like Monticello is a great place to go and drive if you're a member there or you have a friend who's a member who can take you. Um, but I like Manhattan, too. I used to drive through Manhattan on Sundays at like 6 in the morning in my Lola. That was pretty cool. Well, we have some very good drivers. You know, this is an interesting question that you ask. For endurance sports car racing, you cannot go flat out for 24 hours, and a car cannot go flat out for 24 hours. If you want to win the 24 hours of Nürburgring, you have to drive 830 laps. Now, that's not the Norse life that you know at 630. It, it also includes the Grand Prix track, so it's a pretty quick lap. Whereas you could qualify, let's say, at about 8.10. So the drivers I like are, are people that are a little older, so they'll listen to you, and um, ones that are very steady. But there are some people, like the Nuremberg you could not race at unless you really know that track. It's a 16-mile lap, and it's very hard to it's very hard to learn. But of the modern drivers, um, when we go to Le Mans, we'll have a lot of big people who want to drive with us. And the key is to find people who are good, but calm, and aren't like, um, you know, too full of themselves. <laughs> because that, that can be a problem with drivers. And we also look for women, because women generally um, are much smarter than guys when they drive and they listen well, and they do what you tell them. And um, we, um, we have a number of women that we've been testing, especially for our Le Mans program.